the invisible hand of Iranian regime terror in the run-up to Ramadan. Join us on Our Middle East. We'll tell you how the Iranian regime is shaking up the region. Shalom from Jerusalem. Ahalan wasalan. I'm Dan Diker, and this is our Middle East. Al Shak al Ausat Lana. I'm very honored today to have a special guest, Yoni Ben Menachem, the former Director General of Israel's Broadcast Authority and a uh, leading expert on the Arab world and Islam and terrorism in the Middle East. We're going to be talking about Iran's invisible hand in terrorizing the region, something that may not be clear to many of our viewers in the West who are seeing lots of terror, but in small bite-sized pieces, not getting an entire picture. Yoni ben Menachem, welcome. We're going to try and put this very complicated picture together in this uh, Middle East, which is why we call the program Our Middle East, because it's, it's, uh, it's a Middle East of, of Jews and Arabs, Muslims, Christians, and, and other minorities across the region. And we're facing a major terror problem you've been writing about a lot, which is much more integrated than it is than it is decentralized yeah first of all thank you for having me and uh, I'm, I'm glad that you picked this subject because it's very important uh, subject uh, especially uh, towards ramadan the holy uh, month of the muslims which is going to start uh, this week and uh, we're already seeing uh, disturbing signs uh, for what is going to happen in the coming month and this is uh, going to have an effect uh, over the whole region because one of the um, ideas of the Iranians and uh, some of the terror organizations, uh, Palestinian terror organization is to uh, focus the world uh, attention on what is going on, on in Israel, especially uh, in the Temple Mount or Al-Aqsa Mosque as they call it. Uh, and they are going to use uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque as a trigger to start a new intifada, uh, an armed intifada against Israel, like they did in May uh, 2021. Uh, and uh, the other uh, trigger that they are going to uh, try to use is the security prisoners or the uh, Palestinian terrorists who are inside Israeli jails. And uh, they just announced this morning the um, uh, security prisoners in Israel that they are going to have a hunger strike in the beginning of Ramadan. Where a hunger strikes, we're talking about uh, 5,000 uh, security prisoners, Palestinian security prisoners, who are in Israeli jail. Uh, and why did they pick up these two uh, uh, subjects, the uh, prisoners and the, uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, the Temple Mount? Why did they pick that? Because these are very sensitive issues among the Palestinian society and anything that is connected to these two issues is can be a trigger to incite the Palestinians against Israel. For sure, but I want to I want to uh, trace all of this back for our listeners to the Iranian regime in Tehran. The IRGC, the Iranian the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps has been the engine of terrorism. Exactly. And it's played out on the Palestinian front. People think that uh, you know, we've seen in the last week and a half several major terror attacks we saw one up in northern israel at the megiddo junction that came from lebanon in which a terror operative dispatched by the hezbollah which israeli intelligence has determined is an iranian regime action they laid an ied uh, the type of uh, incendiary uh, device that was laid in iraq against american troops was laid by an iranian operative in northern israel one terrorist was killed. The other one was captured um, as as he made his way uh, to towards central Israel. And then there's a and then there was another major terror attack in Dizen, on Dizengoff Street in one in the main thoroughfare in okay. the in Israel's uh, main city of Tel Aviv by a Hamas operative. And you made the point in one of our discussions uh, just a few days ago that you can that the Iranian octopus with his tentacles out from Dizengoff, northern Israel. Um, okay, so let's go to the big, big picture, and uh, the big picture is that 
after uh, the, the war in Gaza in May 2021, what we call in Hebrew Shomer HaChomot. The, the Guardian of the Walls. The Guardian of the Walls. Uh, after this operation, uh, the, uh, the revolution, uh, revolutionary guards uh, in Iran with the Palestinian terror organizations, with Hamas and Islamic Jihad, they uh, started uh, to think ab about a new strategy, how to uh, destabilize Israel and how to create a new uh, armed intifada against Israel. And uh, it started by the ideas of the Islamic Jihad, the head of the Islamic Jihad, the Ziyad al-Nahala, the Secretary General, who went to Iran a few times to discuss it with the uh, Hussein Salami, the head, the commander of the uh, Revolutionary Guards. And they started to set up the uh, uh, armed Palestinian groups in the north of the West Bank, in the north of Judea and Samaria. Uh, and they uh, uh, started to set up what they called battalions, uh, uh, of armed uh, Palestinians, uh, uh, armed groups of uh, Palestinians. Like the Lion's Den in Nablus? Uh, yes, the Lion's Den are independent, supposed to be independent. We'll get to it in the middle, but they started with the Jenin Battalion. This was the first group that they set up uh, um, and they allowed other factions, uh, since the Islamic Jihad is very strong in Jenin, as, as a lot of uh, fact in Jenin, uh, it was the, the the one who founded the, this group, the Jenin Battalion, and they allowed other factions to join in, like Fatah, like uh, Hamas, like Popular Front. And after they set uh, the Jenin uh, Battalion, and uh, the Jenin Battalion they started to make terror attacks, and it was uh, successful in, in their point of view, then they started to copycat this uh, model uh, and to transfer it to other uh, towns and villages uh, in the West Bank. S parallel to the creation of the uh, battalion of Jenin, another armed group, uh, which is called the Lion's Den, started in uh, Nablus. Uh, it was Ibrahim and Nabulsi and other uh, who got uh, killed by the Israeli army and other terrorists who joined in and also set up a, a new terror group called the Lion's Den. Uh, today, we, are, we have about uh, eight to ten terror groups all over the north of the West Bank of Judea of Samaria. Uh, uh, they are in the framework of a battalion uh, who are making terror attacks uh, at IDF soldiers and settlers who live in the West Bank. So, the, is there a unified command structure, or is this a decentralized um, network? Of, of groups that is somehow that is inspired in some way directed by the IRGC. It started uh, in Jenin, as uh, as I said, the, the Islamic Jihad is the one who founded this group. Uh, in Nablus, it was independent, but now uh, the Lions, then, for instance, are supported by Hamas. Are supported, they get a lot of money from Hamas. And Hamas gets money from uh, Tehran. Exactly, and uh, they get uh, the money from Hamas, the Lions, then, and this is what uh, uh, makes them keep moving, you know, uh, as far as uh, 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 money and uh, weapons. I just want to clarify for our listeners, many d forget, Yoni, that the Islamic Jihad, which is a Sunni Islamist terror organization is a branch office of the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps in Gaza and in parts of West Bank, Judea, and Samaria. And People also, don't realize that. They think it's just strictly Palestinian groups no, fighting no, for what they no. call Palestinian rights. It's not that at all. These are, for, uh, for you mentioned the Islamic Jihad. Uh, the Islamic Jihad, the, the uh, um, headquarters of the Islamic Jihad is in Damascus. Uh, right next to uh, Hassan Nasrallah of Hezbollah. And yesterday, uh, Hassan Nasrallah met with Ziyad Nahala, uh, the head of the Islamic Jihad, to coordinate uh, uh, the activities, terror activities, activities there during Ramadan. Inside Israel. And they called the Radwan, the Radwan Brigade. Where, we'll we'll get to the Radwan Brigade. I'm talking about terror attacks. Uh, and uh, also, who is uh, also located in Damascus, next to uh, Nasra Nasrara office, next, next to Hezbollah office, Saleh al aruri who is the deputy uh, chief of the uh, Hamas, uh, is also the, li the liaison uh, to uh, Iran and to uh, Hezbollah, and he also uh, 
uh, meets on a daily basis with Hassan Nasrallah. So what we have in Damascus is the, the head of the octopus, uh, octopus. Um, uh, sometimes it's in, it's in uh, Damascus, sometimes it's in Iran, because they travel. Salah El Aruri and Hassan Nasrallah and uh, Ziad El Lahala, they also travel to Tehran to meet with Hussein Salami, the head of the Revolutionary Guards. So this is how the system works. And from there, the uh, orders go down to uh, the West Bank and Gaza, how to deal with Israel, what to do where to do the terror attacks, sometimes they're coordinated bet between themselves. For instance, you mentioned the uh, um, terror attack in the Megiddo Junction with the uh, big uh, explosive uh, that was uh, planted on the side of the road. Uh, the Israeli security uh, forces are now investigating into it, but they are sure that Hezbollah is behind this attack. It, it might be, have been a, a joint operation of uh, uh, Hezbollah and uh, of Hamas in Lebanon. They have also uh, uh, units in Lebanon, Hamas. So it might have been a joint operation, uh, but it's very dangerous. It's, a, it's, it's an alarming sign uh, because uh, Hezbollah has been quiet uh, for a long time. But now, after what happened last year, uh, uh, the, the agreement between Israel and Lebanon about uh, dividing the uh, economic water, what we call, um, uh, they are sure, Hassan Nasrallah is sure that because uh, he uh, um, um, launched uh, four drones uh, towards the Karish uh, gas rig and, uh, and threatened Israel, and he, he thinks that he's sure that because uh, the Lapid government Surrender to his demands and signed a disagreement of the of the economic water according to what Hezbollah wanted. So he's he's, he's sure that he is now uh, able to force uh, other uh, uh, dictate other uh, things to Israel, and he also is looking at what is happening in Israel. You know this. Uh, big demonstrations uh, all over Israel for because of the uh, legal reform that the Netanyahu governments want to carry out, uh, and uh, is sure that Israel is weakened and Israel is is going to to fall apart. I want to raise one issue. Do you know that Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General of the Iranian-backed Hezbollah, is today using the same language? Israel is as weak as a spider web as he used um, uh, many years ago. Uh, just before the second Lebanon war, you remember yes, in 2006. Yes, yes. he using he, he, the, this whole idea of the spider web is something that he likes to repeat all the time. Uh, you you mentioned what he said last week. He talked about he gave a speech, and uh, he talked about uh, this new law uh, in the Knesset that Israel wants to kill the, or ex execute the, the uh, terrorists who are killing death his, sentence to the, terrorists. Exactly, death death sentence to Israelis, and he said. Uh, this is a big mistake because Israel is falling apart. He said it in his own words. So this indicates that he really thinks so because he delivered it in his speech. By the way, uh, on the coming Wednesday, in three days, he's going to uh, deliver another speech uh, and he's going to relate to what happened uh, in uh, Megiddo Junction. So it will be very interesting to see how we will relate to the Israeli accusations that he's behind this attack. I don't know if he will deny or, or confirm, but he's going to talk about it, apparently, because uh, people in Lebanon are afraid from his, an Israeli retaliation and they want to know what's going to happen. So uh, he's going to talk about it on Wednesday. You know, in, in uh, contrast to uh, Nasrallah's weakness himself in the last years, he's been hiding out in an underground bunker for a number of years. He's separated from his family. He's got uh, five or six children. He doesn't see his uh, his wife or uh, or his children uh, in the past years very frequently. But now he's sort of become much more self confident, believing that uh, Israel is in this is very vulnerable moment. And I want our readers to uh, readers. I want our listeners and viewers to understand that Israel is at this moment surrounded by Iran and its proxies. It in. You have Iran is essentially the uh, the balabite or the uh, uh, the owner, if you will, of Syria. I Syria doesn't operate as an independent actor of the Iranian regime. If you move a little bit uh, to the west, uh, Iran and its Hezbollah proxies control Lebanon. They control the parliament. 
They, they essentially control the government, and they control everything that goes on um, uh, within the security realm uh, or the terror realm from Lebanon. And then we move south, and Yoni, ben Amahen, Yoni, you have written extensively about Iran's footprint and direction and control in Gaza of Hamas. And in fact, you wrote in 219 about the political strategy of Iran in Gaza, which, which manifested itself in the Great March of Return, which the Western world thought was this sort of ground, ground up, uh, popular, uh, you know, peaceful um, expression of, of uh, Palestinian discontent with uh, the situation in Gaza. And you pointed out to our readers at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs that this is not at all a popular uh, uprising. This is a planned strategic decision made in Tehran on beha- uh, this for was, Hamas. Uh, this was, uh, now that you mention it, it was uh, something that was agreed between Qasem Soleimani and Yahya Sinwar. This was the idea that they formulated together, and Yechia Sinmar carried it out in the field. He gave the orders to to, to so implement. The former, the, the head of Hamas. The head of Hamas in Gaza. He gave the orders to implement it on the field. So, uh, of course, you mentioned the, all the proxies of Iran, but uh, don't even forget the uh, rebels, the Houthi rebels in Yemen and uh, the uh, pro-Iranian militias in Syria and, and in Iraq, Iraq and yeah. in Iraq. And of course, uh, the two proxies in Gaza Strip, Hamas and Islamic Jihad, uh, and they're all equipped with uh, uh, very sophisticated Iranian weapons with rockets and drones. And uh, this is a big danger for Israel. So we have to be ready. Uh, to face this uh, danger which is coming from Iran. So let me just m- move over, let we call it open parenthesis in this discussion. Okay. Here you have a week ago, Saudi Arabia and the Iranian regime had, uh, some people are calling it the rapprochement, you know, in, in French. Yes. I, I prefer to say it's more of a hudna. It's more, they call it a, uh, a return to diplomatic relations. But people like yourself, who are experts in Islamic and Arab culture, understood the language of the, of the document in Arabic really refers to, to a return to diplomatic relations, which does not indicate partnership. It does not indicate warmth. It does not indicate a what in French is a rapprochement, which we understand in the West to mean a real, a real mutual embrace. That's not what it means, is it, Yoni? No, it's, it doesn't mean that. But uh, you have to remember, we're talking about, uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, Iran, we're talking about the the leader of the Shiite world. And when we talk about Saudi Arabia, we talk about the leader of the Sunnite, of the Sunni world. And uh, the Sunni and the Shia, they have a, a dispute or a, a division uh, 1,005 years ago. 1,500 years ago. 500 years ago. With the death after, of the Prophet. After, after the Prophet Muhammad died, and there was a big argument who will be the successor of the Prophet Muhammad. And this is what is split. And this split continues till this very day. And it's very naive to think that uh, just because of a political agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, these differences will go away. So they both, apparently, they both. Both sides need it now to make them some sort of a rapprochement, like, like you said, yes? But it doesn't mean that the differences are over. And this is why the Saudis, if you follow the, the Saudi statement in the, in the recent days, the, the, the uh, Saudi foreign minister and other uh, senior uh, Saudis, they say that the test is in the implant, implementation of this agreement. We want to see the Iranians implement what was agreed upon. And this is the big question. How will... Uh, Iran uh, fulfilled the commitments that it gave uh, to the Saudis. Look, the first uh, stage is very easy, to open the embassies, both in Riyadh and uh, in Tehran. You know, they closed the embassies after there was... Uh, Seven years ago, when, exactly. they, when they killed... When, uh, exactly, when they killed the, the, the prof, the one of the uh, Islamic leaders, uh, the Shiite. And uh, this is the, the, the implementation, but there's another... Uh, thing that very important in this agreement. Iran committed itself not to intervene, not to interfere in the in, in internal uh, Saudi's affairs. And this is something that the Iranians could not st- cannot stick to because the whole policy is based on 
uh, uh, spreading the uh, uh, Shiite Islam all over the Middle East. That means to Saudi Arabia, to all the, 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 the uh, Sunni uh, Muslim countries in the Middle East. And th this is the big test. So, okay, we'll wait two months, we'll see these op embassies open up and we'll see if it, what is, what's going to be the next stage. But on the long run, I doubt it that they will be able to, the Iranians will be able to sit quietly and not continue with their policy to uh, spread what they call the Islamic revolution of uh, Khomeini. Uh, this is something that I've been doing from 1979 in the Middle East, and uh, they're not going to stop. And uh, You see very aggressive Iranian regime behavior, diplomatic behavior. Uh, even in the last several days, they, uh, the, the, Saudi, the uh, Iranian foreign minister made a trip to the UAE and, uh, and met with the, the emirate, his emirate uh, counterparts. And you really wonder to what degree um, this new diplomatic front, if you will, by Iran will hurt Israel's relationship with its Abraham Accord partners, not because the Gulf countries led by the, um, you know, the, 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 the secret hand, if you will, of Saudi Arabia, but because by, by virtue of the, um, you know, just the re-engagement can elicit certain um, senses of, in, the, in the Arab Sunni world and certainly in the Gulf, that they, they should be a little bit more quiet or a little bit more hesitant about Israel? I think that uh, it will definitely have a, an effect on the Israeli efforts to have a normalization agreement with Saudi Arabia. This is uh, one of the main goals of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, and I think that uh, the Saudis now uh, are uh, dancing on a few ropes because uh, they read uh, the picture. They, they saw the weakness of the Biden administration uh, in the Middle East. They uh, saw, see that uh, Biden, President Biden is hesitating and doesn't want to have any uh, military options in order to restrain the Iranians. Uh, and they counted on Israel to uh, maybe have a military attack on the nuclear facilities of, of Iran. Uh, but now they see the problems also in Israel. Uh, they saw the, they see the um, uh, demonstrations. They, they, they think that the government is weak. Uh, they see that uh, Biden does not support the military option, doesn't give Israel the weapons that it needs in order to attack the military facilities in Iran. And they want to secure themselves. Uh, 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 Mohammed bin Salman, who is the strong man in Saudi Arabia, is the, the actual ruler in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Mohammed bin Salman, he wants to guarantee that nothing will happen to Saudi Arabia. So he said, okay, if you cannot beat them, the Iranians, let's join them. So he joined them and they made this agreement with them, but it will not stick for long. I'm sure that it will not stick for long. You know, the danger here, and I want to point out to our viewers and our listeners that the Iranians are very, very shrewd uh, chess players, and they understand. Excellent negotiators. And great negotiators, uh, smiles and smiles, and you can get stabbed in the back and in the front, and, you'll say, and you won't even realize that you were stabbed until you bled to death, and you asked them to stick another knife in your back because you didn't even realize what they did. Right. And using this analogy, Yoni, they understand that the major danger to Israel is to keep intensifying the Palestinian front because they understand that that's what the West understood. I mean, you know that Secretary of State Blinken, President Biden, the, the European Union, everybody's focusing, and I would say way over-focusing on the Palestinian front, but that's the way the Iranian regime understands that it can turn attention away from its own torture and murder, and if you read the, read the news reports coming out, rape of children who are uh, battling for their own freedom, and they get taken to Evan prison, and they get raped and tortured, and they want to take international attention away from the home front in Iran. They want to divert the focus of the international community that was on Iran because of the hijab protest, because of the nuclear uh, uh, weapons. And also now there's another story in Iran of, uh, of poisoning. I don't know if you... Poisoning schoolgirls. Exactly, exactly. So they want to divert the uh, world focus, the world, the world in, uh, attention from Iran to Israel and the Palestinians. And you know, but Palestinians are considered underdog 
And why not use this card? So what they want to do now is also use the holy month of Ramadan, use religion, and uh, incite and provoke and create a new intifada. The question is whether the Palestinian public will, uh, will go for a new intifada. So far, there are no signs that uh, it will really uh, go there. So it, it depends a lot of what Israel will do towards these provocations and towards these terror attacks that are planned by uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad and, and these uh, armed groups in the, in the West Bank. It's very important how Israel will react and respond to these terror attacks. So it's very important that, uh, and I think that Israel knows that and understands that there will be no collective punishments and there will be very focused and targeted uh, reaction to any terror attacks only uh, towards the terrorists that are responsible for these attacks and not for the whole pop uh, Palestinian population. You know, there, there is a very sensitive state of affairs going on in the Palestinian um, areas, as you know, or Palestinian Authority controlled areas, as you know, uh, Yoni, because you, you write about it as much as anybody. There was an extraordinary Palestinian poll that came out just a few days ago that showed there was 78 percent support in the Palestinian public for the murder, the terrorist murder of um, the Israeli Jewish brothers, um, Hillel and Yagel uh, Yaniv, who were murdered in Hawara from Har Bracha, from Har Bracha uh, which is a Jewish community very close to Nablus. Right. Now, you see an overwhelming support by the Palestinian public, 1,200 people polled, Palestinian poll done. That they, There's and, another poll, very interesting also, that more than 50% of the Palestinian uh, population uh, think that the PA, the Palestinian Authority, have no right to arrest these armed terrorist group's members. Uh, this is very interesting. And also... Over 60% want to return to what they call the armed struggle, which exactly. we understand. Exactly. And also 77%, they, they demand that Abu Mazen will step down and not stay in his office because he's uh, collaborating with Israel. Right. That's so this right. is the atmosphere that is so in the it's, a, it's an atmosphere, uh, you know, Khaled Abu Tuame of the Jerusalem Post, who's a, a regular co-host on this program, always calls it the, radical, the massive radicalization of the Palestinian public, which makes it impossible for Israel uh, to negotiate a peace agreement because, the, the, as you said just now, anybody that, that uh, coordinates, collaborates with Israel for normalization, for peace, for moving forward on the diplomatic track is accused of being a collaborator in the worst sense of the word uh, uh, with yeah. Israel. So, And also uh, more than 70% are against the idea of two-state solution. So when the Americans and when the European unions and uh, all these people in the, in the UN, when they called Israel to agree for a two-state solution, first they have to ask, ask the Palestinians to agree for it. Because the Palestinian public doesn't want that. They don't want it. In fact, I want to, I want to uh, make our, our language accurate. This, this notion of a two-state solution is a, is a complete misnomer and inaccurate because Israel as a UN member, democratic state of the nation, state of the Jewish people, exists. It has existed since 1948. So the, the, the idea on the table for the last 30 years since the, the uh, infamous Oslo Accords was to create some sort of a Palestinian entity. Yitzhak Rabin of blessed memory said, less than a state, more than autonomy. So this sort of morphed into this idea of a two-state solution, which was, which was, I think, is a completely inaccurate way of referring to it because it means that if there's not two states, there's no solution. And we argue... But we also, people forget, we already have a Palestinian state. In well, you have, three, state. you have three Palestinian <laughs> states. You <laughs> have, have Gaza. Exactly. You have the two million Palestinians living in Israel, which they have full rights as full citizens of Israel. And then you have areas A and B, which is sort of a Hong Kong-like mini-state exactly. um, that is operating by the Palestinian Authority that the Palestinian public hates for its corruption, its lack of human rights, and its, uh, you know, its uh, uh, a real uh, problematic uh, self-interest that does nothing to help the Palestinian public. So we have Hamastan. We call what is happening in Gaza because there are, there's a state there. There's a Palestinian state there. there is a, they have their own sovereignty. They have their own army. They have their own flag. They have everything, their own leadership. They have elections when they want. So they have a state already there, right? Well, which the, I call Hamastan. 
So why do why should we give them another uh, state here in Judea or Samaria, which is part of Israel? Well, there. So there. Th- now the question becomes: In the last few minutes of our program, I want to move back talk about deterrence. We we'll say the 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 word of the day is harta'a, which in Hebrew means deterrence. Israel is in a very, very shaky, sensitive, unstable situation. Uh, from a national security and military standpoint. And that's what I want to underscore in this program, that this is not about this Palestinian armed terror group or that Palestinian armed terror group. This is about the Iranian regime octopus uh, whose, tentacles have, uh, whose tentacles have spread from Tehran to Iraq to Syria to Lebanon and then all the way down to Gaza. And they are basically surrounding this teeny Jewish democratic state that is about the size of Maryland. So the question is, in your view, as a security analyst, as a Middle East expert, what can Israel do to deter the Iranian octopus? We can do a lot. We can do a lot. We, uh, I don't want to go into the sensitive details, but uh, you know, it's been, it's been published, published in uh, all over the world that the uh, uh, Israeli Mossad uh, made the secret, secret attacks inside uh, Iran. Uh, stole the, uh, Israel also admitted to it, it stole the uh, nuclear archive from Tehran, which was a very important operation and, and that uh, discovered the, the lies of Iran, how them having a secret, a secret military uh, program to make a nuclear bomb. Uh, and uh, the also uh, very important uh, Iranian figures in the nuclear program and nuclear project were assassinated uh, in Iran. Uh, and according to uh, what the Iranians say, the Israeli Mossad is uh, behind it. Qasem Soleimani, you're talking about. Uh, Also, Qasem Soleimani was killed by the Americans right. in, in Iraq, by the American army. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Mohsen Fahrizadeh, the head of the nuclear uh, pro- Iranian program, who was assassin- assassinated in Iran, and the Iranians blamed the Mossad for killing him. So uh, Israel has a, a long hand and can reach Iran, it can reach the most sensitive facilities of Iran, nuclear facilities, secret programs, and this is only part of the of what is Israel is planning. Israel, the Israeli army now is uh, uh, working very extensively with the Air Force on a or program. This is also not something secret that I'm revealing uh, to attack the nuclear facilities uh, in Iran in case it will be uh, needed to do that. Uh, and so the Israel has power and Israel will be united. All the, the enemies, they think that uh, what is happening now, the demonstrations uh, in Israel will lead to a civil war are wrong, in my opinion. Israel will unite and will face Iran and Israel is a very strong country and uh, has a very strong military and the IDF can overcome all these uh, challenges and all these uh, difficulties, I think. What is important is that we will be united and we'll know what we want. And we, once we know what we want and we'll be united, we will win in every uh, battle uh, with the Iranians. You know, the way you speak uh, confidently uh, with, uh, with hope and dedication, commitment uh, to the state of Israel and then the internal strength of Am Yisrael, of the Jewish people, is it would be the discussion we would have in this podcast if it were not on television with a lot of our uh, Sunni Gulf uh, uh, neighbors who, who look today at the state of Israel as the solution to the Middle East, not as the problem in the Middle East. And they, uh, they would, um, in, in, and I've heard it with my own ears and, and seen it with my own eyes, and I think you have too, in private discussions with people in the region uh, from the Gulf countries, their hatred uh, for the Iranian regime and its destabilization of every single country. In fact, only 12 months ago, the, the UAE and the Saudis were talking about an imminent attack on uh, sovereign uh, Saudi territory uh, by the Iranian regime. Uh, and they are talking in this way, as you have ex- expressed on this uh, podcast, Our Middle East, um, about Israel as uh, their partner and their solution, mm-hmm. and the solution to the, the, the security instability that has been continuing to be caused by the Iranian regime. And it was no other than Prince, uh, uh, Prince uh, uh, Faisal of Turkey, who said ju- just the other day on France 24, uh, that uh, he has great hesitations about uh, the Iranian regime, has great hesitations about returning 
uh, Iran's proxy state, Syria, back to the Arab League. So it, it looks like, uh, it seems like, and with this, it will, perhaps we'll have to end the last idea, that it may be the best thing for Israel and Saudi Arabia to have a secret, very quiet relationship to allow uh, the countries to continue to cooperate against the Iranian regime octopus as opposed to having a public uh, a public reconciliation. Your I, th view. I think that the Saudis, they know very well the Iranians and they don't believe this agreement that was signed, but they're playing the game because uh, they have to secure uh, themselves for, for, uh, for the few coming months. Uh, so this is the, one of the games of the Middle East, but they, they know the real intentions of the Iranians and they know they cannot rely on the promises of Iran and the, the Iranians will violate this agreement once it will be their interest to do so. Uh, so, uh, and they know that Israel is a reliable ally and I think they will continue all these uh, secret channels that they have with Israel. There you have it. I hope we've given our, uh, our listeners and our viewers a little bit of insight on the regional reality of this, yes. of our Middle East, al-Shakr uh, Ausat Lana, uh, Yoni Ben Menachem, uh, leading Arab and Islamic affairs expert, security expert, and former head of the Israel Broadcasting Authority. It's always a pleasure. Thank you're you a great for teacher for us. It's a, it's a great and, uh, pleasure. I and think it's a good, it's a very good idea what you do, and uh, I hope you will continue with it. Would you tell that to my mom? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us Thank on you. Our Middle East. We'll see you again very soon as we unpack the Middle East from the inside out. Thank you.